this morning. I'm going to be speaking from Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. I know we read it earlier, so I won't read it again. But I might refer back to pieces back and forth. I grew up in a semi-religious home. And what that means is we went to church at Easter, we went to church at Christmas. Um, and in between, we would go a few times throughout the year. I grew to hate Sundays because um, if we didn't go to church, we couldn't listen to our music, you know, our R&B, our hip hop, our smooth jazz. And uh, we would be told we had to turn it off or, and today was a day of rest and we couldn't do anything. And, so I would sneak into my room and turn on the music very, 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 very low so that I could still listen to it on Sundays. You know, behavior was determined um, and used to determine your goodness in my home. If you behaved good, then you were a good person. If you listened to my parents and your brother when he bullied you, you were a good girl. If you behaved bad, you were a bad person. If you were disobedient, you were a bad person. There arose a strong sense of right and wrong. Uh, and I began to equate that sense of right and wrong with me. So it wasn't I did right and wrong. It, I, it was I was right or I was wrong. The problem with growing up like that is that you will find your wrong far outweighs your right. And so I internalized not measuring up. It, it was no longer I did right or I did wrong. It became I am wrong. And it was a deep sense of my identity growing up. Needless to say that when I first heard about the grace of God, it took me more than a decade to begin to grasp grace, which had nothing to do with my behavior, but everything to do with he who bestows grace. And so as I look in our society, I know we have the same pattern. We embrace this pattern and it is well ingrained. It starts in childhood. If children listen to mommy, they get ice cream. If they don't, they go to bed early. If Chris, as we see Christmas approaching, everybody's eyes are on Santa because Santa has his infamous list. The naughty list where you got coal or the nice list. And so an entire new generation is growing up with a strong sense of identifying what they do with who they are. This is the context in which we find this story. Verse 15 or verse 11 to 32 focuses on the lost son, but it is not the first story Jesus uses to address this problem of equating people's identity with their behavior. So as I studied, I looked up 
parable because that's what it is. It's a parable. And the Greek word for parable is paraboli, I think. <laughs> that's how you pronounce it. And it signifies a placing of one thing beside another in order to compare the two. Jesus uses a mindset that exists to teach a very significant lesson. According to Vine's expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words, there are two dangers that must be avoided when you're trying to figure out what the parable really says. The first that you must avoid is ignoring the important features of the parable. So the thing that is repeated, don't ignore that. And the second thing to avoid is trying to make every single detail mean something. That's not the real purpose. So to avoid this error with this parable, I have narrowed my focus significantly to only include a few things. I'm going to focus on the features of the parable, and I'm going to focus on one particular detail that I believe God wants to get across this morning. Verse 11 begins like this. He says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. So there was a point that he had already established. Here are the points. Number one, there was an item that had been lost. That's significant. Number two, the item was precious to the one who lost it. And number three, the person who lost it searched for it until it was found. And number four, after finding what was lost, there was a great celebration. And I began to see something in this text. The value and worth of something that is lost has nothing to do with what it has done. It has everything to do with the one who lost it. I'm going to say that again. The value of something that has been, that is lost, the value has nothing to do with what it did. It has everything to do with the one who lost it. If a shepherd came in here this morning and I said to him, you have 99 sheep and you lost one, his heart would drop to his belly. But when I say to you, a shepherd lost a sheep, does your heart drop to your belly? Probably not, because the value of that sheep can only be placed by the shepherd. Jesus makes the same illustration with a woman and her coins. The coins that she lost were part of her dowry. It was given to her in the event her husband left her. She would have something to rely on. Now to some of the people listening to this story, that coin has zero value, but to her, it's worth sweeping the house for. Which brings me to the bulk of what I want to focus on, which is the final parable, which is that of the lost son. In doing my study, I realized that what Jesus was doing was actually a normal practice of his day. It's called a rabbinic parable. And this was a story that rabbis used to teach the people about morality. 
there was always a moral lesson behind it as they were responsible for teaching Israel God's laws these are some of the ways they used to do so Jesus was talking to these people he was talking to them who normally were the ones giving the story the Pharisees were the middle class and they didn't just follow Moses law they followed the traditions of their fathers that had been passed down from generation to generation the scribes were the teachers of the law they were not religious they were not political it was more like a occupation they were actually the lawyers of God's law and it meant that they interpreted and taught God's law when an issue happened in the people and a judicial judgment needed to be made it was come to the scribes so they are not unfamiliar with Jesus storytelling Jesus story of the lost son is not just familiar in style but it's actually familiar in story as well there was another story that talked about a lost son and this son had been redeemed from slavery having slighted his father but he had been brought back home as a slave instead of a son so that obedience could be forced upon him it makes me think well Jesus knows why he's teaching this story and it made me think that Jesus used something they would understand an old story a familiar story to introduce something new and the new thing that Jesus introduced in this story is the response of the Heavenly Father you see when the Pharisees told a story it was always from the point of view of the law it was from the point of view of parents or children you must obey your parents honor your father and your mother and so it always incorporated an earthly situation and so because it was an earthly situation it received an earthly response but Jesus takes this earthly story to introduce God's kingdom which was the response of not an earthly father but a heavenly father Jesus substituted the response of a normal earthly Jewish moral lesson with that of the kingdom of God lesson and in so doing exposes something that grabbed me from the first time I read it as I read this story a few times the thing that kept jumping out at me was that of rejoicing it was that the one who had found what was lost always rejoiced but never alone they went out to neighbors and invited them to rejoice with them and that puzzled me a little bit and in looking at this some more I I started to look at the father's response this heavenly father not this moral Jewish father this heavenly father's response and after his son has said father I have sinned against you I've sinned against heaven I've sinned against you I am not worthy I know what I have done I know where I have been I know what I have done with your money you don't know where I've been but I know 
where I have been. And the son approaches the father in that state. But Jesus is not talking about him approaching any father. He's talking about him approaching his heavenly father. And after his confession, this is what blew my mind. The father does not respond to the son. He turns and he responds to the servants. And he says, quick, bring my robe. Put it on him. Quickly, bring shoes. Put it on him. Quick, 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 bring my ring. Put it on him. Go get the fattened calf, which was fattened for special occasions. The Day of Atonement, a marriage. It took time to fatten a calf. And Father says, go get the thing we've been saving and kill it and invite everyone. My son was dead. But now he lives. And the word says, we must celebrate with a feast. This son of mine was dead, but now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And it says, so the party began. What a new concept. What a new concept to having this type of response when you know you've done wrong. Let me ask you something, mamas and papas and aunties and uncles. What would happen in our homes if when our children really messed up, And they came bowed before us, not able to raise their heads because they know they've messed up. What would change for them if they found our embrace and said, you are still my son. You are still my daughter. And I love you. And you walk with them through their mistake. And you tell them, no, 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 no. You belong to the Lord. Don't you lower your head. You belong to me. Come, let's go. I know you've messed up. I know you've done something terrible. But I love you. And God loves you. Let me walk with you through this. I believe Jesus used this story to show us something. The part that captures me is he turns to the servants and he says, go get my stuff and put it on my son. I believe it was Jesus' invitation to his church. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe that a lot of people are coming home. And I believe they're going to smell. And I believe we're not going to know where they came from. But I also believe that the Lord is giving us a sneak preview 
of what he wants us to do when they get here. You see, I believe that the reason the father spoke to the servants is because the son couldn't hear it. He was too filled with shame. He knew where he had been. He knew what he had done. And nothing he could have said to his son would have penetrated at that moment. He knows. So he turns to those who can hear. And he says, you get my robe and put it on him. You get the shoes, put it on him. Get my ring, put it on him. And then let's party. I believe that God is sending a lot of people our way. And our rejoicing over them is what is going to show them God's rejoicing over them. This is how they're going to know that we are Christians by our love. My message is a brief one. I'm done. <laughs> Short and sweet. But I close with this story. I close with this story. Some of you know when I came back to church, I was pregnant with my son at 19 and was broken, beaten, just shame, couldn't lift my head. But the Lord was drawing me. I didn't know it was him but I just wanted to go and I wanted to hear about God. But in my heart and mind, I had one thought when I went back to church. I said, if one person says one thing to me, I am out of here. I'm still here. Do you know what his church did? They loved me. And they said, hey, welcome back. Church, I believe that is what God is calling us to do. And the reason I believe, and I finish with this, that he says to his servants, put my things on my son, is to let us know I have approved of him. And what God calls common, let no man call unclean. He wants us to see him put his stuff on them. And that's it. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> I'm going to ask Pastor Kevin if he has, if he wants to close. But I will say this. I don't know what else to say. But I know this much. I want to be in the place that God can tell me, and I'm going to say it, to the transgender who he is calling. Yes, yes, yes. I want to be in the place to yes, say, welcome yes, home. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Amen. And I'm praying for us that we will all be in that place. Yes, yes, God yes, bless yes, you. Yes.